Hello and welcome to this week's Robin Pod and it's a belter as Hulkington Rovers are set to kick off their 2024 Super League campaign. And don't forget the Robin Pod is powered by Budget Ties Auto Centre, the only car specialist trusted by the players, club officials and supporters of Hull KR. Joining me this week is Dan Craft and Joe Appleyard. But before we speak to them, let's catch up with Sky Sports' Jenna Brooks as she shares her hopes for the new season and what we can expect from Sky. Jenna, it's great to have you back on the Robin Pod, which is now the fourth season of the Robin Pod. I was just thinking, how how long have you been covering the games for Sky now? So I, my first grand final was in 2019, but I'd only done bits and pieces in the lead up to that. I got this job full time a couple of weeks before we went into lockdown. So in 2020, yeah, so my well, first season. Yeah, so f- fully entrenched in rugby league. Though. Obviously a, a f- familiar face to people who tune into Sky Sports for the rugby league coverage. And, and there's some exciting changes for, for 2024. Certainly are. If you haven't heard us banging the drum uh, the last couple of weeks, every game uh, is going to be available live on Sky. It's the only place. Like I know Super League Plus, obviously, going to be showing every game. But if you want to watch the games live, you do that through Sky Sports. So we're so excited. Um, There's just a real different kind of buzz around the build up to this year. You know, as I said, I've been involved in a number of seasons now, but this one does feel different. Yeah, I was, I was going to probably echo what you're saying, Jenna. There does seem to be, whether it's because of the, the IMG provisional gradings for clubs, the fact that clubs have, have got to up the game to make sure that the, they get the, uh, the the right grading, the fact that there's going to be more uh, games ever than before be able to, to watch, whether that's on Sky, the BBC, of course, announcing that they've got the, the free-to-air deal. So I think as a supporter of Rugby League and as a supporter of Super League, it is a really exciting time and, and what a way to open up Super League as well with a whole derby. Absolutely. Cannot wait for that whole derby. But just on what you were saying before, I think it's only right for the sport that finally every game will be able to um, be viewed live. I think it's what the sport needs. I think it's what the sport deserves. Um, It's going to open up to a whole new audience. We're going to get new eyes on the game. Um, You know, Jonna, we always say all it takes is one rugby league game and you're hooked for life. So we're just hoping hoping to, you know, open open the doors up for people who might not necessarily have watched Super League before that they can now watch it. Now, as you said, BBC, I think they've got uh, at least 15 games that they'll be showing this year. Super League Plus is going to be huge as well. And, of course, the Sky Sports streaming service. So, it's all to look forward to. And what a way to start the season with that Hull Derby. Cannot wait. Yeah, I think there's definitely going to be fireworks on, on Thursday night. Obviously, we're recording this just a, a couple of days before then. Um, before we came on, we were just talking about sort of your preparation as well for, for the new season. Obviously, more games. Um, you're probably busier than ever. Yep, busier than ever. <laughs> uh, so more games to be across. Um I think we obviously we've got the podcast going again, our second year doing the bench podcast, which is fantastic. I've also got the Rugby League Verdict, which is every Wednesday, uh, shameless plug, at 3.30 p.m. <laughs> on Sky Sports News. Um, so, yeah, just building up to the season, I feel like uh, I kind of go in feeling refreshed and ready to go. And I am refreshed and I'm super excited and all of that. But at the same time, I'm already exhausted because these first, you know, kind of the, the last couple of weeks building into this, it's been just kind of banging the drum and uh, launch day after launch day. And it, it's just unreal. It, it's so exciting. And I really believe that this season um, it's going to be a bit different and it's just, yeah, so exciting. It's going to be as close as it was last year. It's hard to pick. It's hard to make these early predictions. Um, but, yeah, I just I can't wait for it to get started now. Yeah, there's so many backstories at play as well, isn't there, in, in Super League this season, of course. Uh, we've got the Wigan Warriors. Can they defend their their title? St. Helen's smarting from not being able to to pick them to the post last season. Of course, we've seen a rejuvenated Warrington with Sam Burgess coming in uh, to coach them. Of course, Hulkington Rovers. 
you're on the Robin pod. We're expecting to to hopefully go that one one bit better and, and actually lift some silverware this season. And then there's a number of teams who who struggled last season will be expecting to do better with a raft of new signings, head coaches being changed, and and London Broncos back in Super League. So we've got the big city represented, which is is a welcome addition to Super League again. So there's there's so many stories at play this season. There are. And again, just on the fact that every game is going to be live, I think it's the first time that we're really going to be able to follow every single story um, from the beginning of the season to the very end. Like as a journalist, it's hard for you to kind of travel between games. There's some games that are going to be obviously played at the same time, but you're still going to have access to watch the whole thing. Um, So I think that's massive in terms of the narrative uh, this year. And as you say, there's a story with every team. You pick the team. I mean, St Helens you mentioned how are they going to fare without James Roby they've got some new signings um they're going to be you know determined to come back and and win it Jenna, it's great to have you back on the Robin pod, which is now the fourth. Same time, but you're still going to have access to watch the whole thing. Um, So I think that's massive in terms of the narrative uh, this year. And as you say, there's a story with every team. You pick the team. I mean, St Helens, you mentioned, how are they going to fare without James Roby? They've got some new signings. Um, They're going to be, you know, determined to come back and, and win it again. Paul Wellens is probably fair to say under pressure from the beginning of the year. Uh, you've got Warrington, Sam Burgess. What a story that is. I mean, for me, I, I do believe that that is the story of the season. I think um, all eyes will be on him. Uh, even rugby union lovers are going to be interested in, in what he can do. And I believe even though I did ask him, I, I was lucky enough to do a sit down interview with him um, late last week, which will be available on demand from next week. Um, but I asked him 
if he felt he had a point to prove this side of the world. He, he's obviously proved his point down under as a rugby league player. He's an icon, isn't he? But over here, there's all that bad press about his, you know, the 2015 Rugby Union World Cup. Um, I believe he's going to be, he's going to really want to prove a point over here as a successful head coach. Obviously, Warrington haven't won uh, the title in 69 years. So he's got a massive task ahead of him. Um, Wigan, can they go back to back? Um, Maddie Peets made some really strong signings. It's exciting to see what they can do. Um, you know, Sam Walters, is a, like he, he, massive, massive um, uh, expectation surrounding him in the preseason. Obviously, that collarbone injury is going to rule him out for, I believe, a few months. So that's a massive blow for them. But, you know, they've got the likes of, of Bevan French, who just lights up the pitch. Jay Field lights up the pitch. Uh, it's just going to be really exciting to see what Cruz Leeming can do in the middle as well. But, um, you know, then you go on to your Robins and <laughs> you've lost some hugely influential players. But Willie Peters has brought in the likes of Tyrone May. I think it'll be really exciting to see what he can do with um, with Lewis, with Mikey Lewis, and see how their combination works. You've got Skids moving from that player, the, the captain of the team, into a, a coaching role. You don't have Denny Maguire in that assistant coaching role now. So plenty of stories with your club too. Yeah, definitely. And it's something we've talked about on, on previous Robin pods about um, the expectation around the Robins this season, and especially on Willie Peters, obviously hit the ground running in his debut campaign, um, Challenge Cup final, and then semi-finals of the, the playoffs. And um, I suppose the the expectation is to go one better. But like we've already talked about, there's so many other teams who will be expecting to do better as well. And that for me, this is why it, it looks like it's going to be one of the mo uh, most, if not the most exciting Super League seasons in, in a long time because there's just so many teams vying for that for them playoff spots. And, and when you talk about making predictions, um, I mean, obviously the Robins were expecting to, to be in the playoffs. Nothing's guaranteed. And that's why this is such a great sport, isn't it? That that everything can literally go down to the wire. Not only are you expecting to be in the playoffs, like speaking to some of the players, speaking to Willie Peters himself, I, I feel like you're, you're preparing to win silverware this year. Mm -hmm. Anything less won't be good enough for Willie Peters and his team. Um, you know, I don't have to tell you how disappointed he was with, with what they did last year. But again, it was his first year in charge of that team. And as you said, Challenge Cup final and the semifinals. I mean, I think that that was an outstanding achievement in itself, but it wasn't good enough for him. And this year he is like, no, we're winning silverware. And Yeah, no, I think, Jen, I mean, for, as an outsider looking in, Jen, you'll get to speak to, to the players and the coaches and for me, there seems to be a real steely determination about the club and about Willie Peters and, and the and the he should speak to Elliot Minchella, a real focus, um, which we've not seen for, for a long time. And it, and I think you're right, they are setting their expectations high and, and silverware is definitely what they want to achieve. Um and, and you just get that sense from the players that they're all focused in, in heading in the same direction. And and Willie Peters, he is a hard taskmaster, isn't he? He comes across very well in front of the cameras, but he is, I can imagine in training that he's a hard taskmaster and he does make them players players work, especially when you hear about what they've been doing in pre-season and how tough it is. Um, so Willie Peters, he's done so well in his, his first season. Can he repeat it in, the, in, the, uh, in his second season? Of course, the cameras uh, will be on him on Thursday when we... We're taking our bitter rivals. Are you at the game, Jenna? Are you covering it? Oh, I wouldn't miss it, Jono. I'm there. I'll be on that touch line. I think it's, it's a sellout, isn't it? It's like a record crowd or something, I've heard. Um, so I think the atmosphere, it's always incredible atmosphere at a Hull Derby, but I can't wait. I'm so excited, even if it's going to be like minus five degrees or something. <laughs> Um, whatever, whatever the temp's going to be. I know it's going to be cold, uh, but, but the atmosphere is going to heat it right up. <laughs> yeah, and I think what makes this encounter so intriguing is of course it's opening up Super League it's the first game of the season but also it's the best time to be a supporter because
Jenna, it's great. At the start of the year, you look at Hull KR, you compare them to, to Hull FC, and I think it's one city but two towns that are preparing differently for the season. As we touched on, Hull KR are preparing to make the playoffs, if not win silverware, whereas I think you could say the black and whites are hoping to make the playoffs. So um, I know that Wigan went there in pre-season. I think they beat them 40-0 from memory. Um, just speaking to like Willie Isa, he's he told, he's like, I think they're going to be good this year, Hull FC. So you never really know. I think Tony Smith is, is one of the best coaches in our competition. He's certainly one of the most experienced. What he did with Hull KR when he was there was so exciting. I think that we can maybe expect a little bit more of that open play from Hull FC. Um, as you said, they've made some some big signings. They have also lost some some influential players, as I suppose you could say every team has. Um, I'm excited to see what this Franklin Pele can do. Um, but yeah, I just I think it's going to be an outstanding game. I think it's going to be close. Um, you know, I guess if you're going off last year, you're going to say Hull KR are going to win, but then Hull KR are at the enemy's home. So who knows? I don't know. I don't know. All I know, it's going to be one not to not to miss. Yeah, 100%. And I'm sure you'll receive a, a warm welcome in Hull, as you always do when you, you come across with the Sky TV cameras. Who, who's covering the game on, on Thursday for Sky? Um, so in studio, you will have Sam Tompkins, John Wilkin, and of course, Brian Carney, uh, in comms, it will be, I think it's Dave Woods yeah. and Kyle Amor, I think, but don't quote me on that. Um, but yeah. And then of course I'll be on the touchline, which, uh, I love, I love my job. I feel blessed every day. Um, but yeah, so it'll be, it'll be a good one. Yeah, you might want to bring some uh, earmuffs with you on Thursday because I'm sure you might hear a few expletives from the, if you get so close to the crowd. And my heated gelée, and my heated gelée, <laughs> don't forget that. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was just going to mention, it's actually uh, funny you mentioned about Dave Woods, of course, uh, a whole raft of new recruits, not just in Super League, but for covering Super League as well for Sky Sports this season. I'm so excited. So obviously we've got Dave Woods in, uh, Mark Wilson, Kyle Amor, um, Bill Arthur will still be covering games, which I'm so happy about. Um, but yeah, just the addition of those new voices. And then you've got the girls. So I'm not the only female on the team anymore. So I've got Corker, Courtney Winfield Hill, who I think is uh, one of the most outstanding pundits I've ever worked with, uh, full stop. And then Jodie Cunningham, who is one of the most remarkable women I've ever met. Um, she's such an incredible ambassador for the game and, and hugely talented as well. So, so excited to to welcome them to our family and, um, yeah, hear them hear them on, on Sky. Yeah, and part of the big rebranding for, for Super League this season was the bringing the women's and uh, wheelchair game and the men's game under all on one Super League banner and um, about time, I say, Jono, about time. <laughs> one, 100%. And, and people who were fans of the female game are going to be able to watch more games than ever, ever as well this season. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, and I can tell you that both the grand final of the wheelchair and the women's will be live on Sky Sports as well. Um, so, yeah, it's going to be a massive year across all three competitions. Um, I think it's it's just another nod to how important this this sport is to sky we love this sport and i think um sometimes fans can get caught up in the figures and get caught up in things that they probably don't know the whole story around but what this new deal does what these additions to the team do is illustrate just how important this game is to sky sports um, so I just, yeah, I kind of want to get that message across as well because it is, you know, the the team that is behind, not just the people that you see on camera, but the people that work tirelessly behind the scenes, the producers, the APs, the vision mixers, um, the directors, you know, they give up their time, they sacrifice so much and they love this game. We all love this game so much and we want to see it succeed. We really do. And I feel like the changes that have been made in 2024 are going to take a huge step towards um, towards the success of the sport. Yeah, Jenna, you have a fantastic season. A safe journey over to Hull on Thursday. And thank you once again for coming on the Robin Pod and hopefully we'll get you on during the course of the season uh, in 2024. Thanks for having me, Jono.
Good evening, chaps. Welcome to the Robin Pod, Dan, Joe. I don't think I'll ever get sick of hearing Jenna say Jono. Uh, no. <laughs> yeah. It's a uh, very entertaining way from Jenna, of course, c- covering the game on uh, Thursday for Sky Sports. Um, Joe, come to you first, mate. How are you doing? The anticipation, the excitement, it's all building up, isn't it? Yeah, you know, just like I said, you just you get the excitement, don't you? Now the Super League's back, everything, you know, what you and Jenna were speaking about then, Super League plus wheelchair women's game, everything seems to be under one roof now. And I think off the field, it's probably been the most positive I've seen the sport. And obviously it all accumulates to Thursday night when we go to the MKM. But I think with all the games going to be on telly, the BBC deal, new look commentary, you can't complain. We've wanted this for years now, haven't we? And I think it's going to be one of the biggest, hopefully one of the best seasons to date because we need to grow the sport now. 100%. And apologies to anyone who experienced any uh, any problems there listening to the first part of the Robin Pod uh, live Pods don't always go to plan, but hopefully you'll have, you've got to hear from what Jenna had to say. Uh, Dan, welcome back to the Robin Pod, mate. How are you doing? Yeah, not too bad, Jenna. Great to have you back. How are you? How's the nerves ahead of Thursday? Or are you one of those Rovers supporters who are experiencing any nerves? I mean, there's a there's a bit of a, a confidence about the the Rovers support at the moment. Yeah, I'm not nervous. I don't say I'm nervous. I, I do think we'll win. Um, I think in the, in the tipping league, I think I've got the, the narrowest margin. Though. I haven't, I've got eight points on last year. I think I'm um, the most pessimistic. But, oh, you know, on paper, you look at the two sides, we should be sure of the top, shouldn't we? That's it, Joe. The squads were announced early today. Um, obviously, Hull Kingston Rovers name in their squad will FC at lunchtime. Um, when you look at the teams, I look at the teams, Joe, and I look at the squad. And I think if we go player to player, you know, I don't know if it's maybe a, a bit of arrogance, but I, 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 I think that that squad that we've named blows them out the water. Yeah, do you know what? I've heard that term arrogance a few times and it's hard to say that because it's the first game of the season and I know everyone's going off the back of last season, but there is that arrogance because of what they did last year and obviously of who we brought in. I mean, I was saying to my pals earlier, you take away that derby narrative and who you're playing against and it's round one. You look at them two squads on paper, you look at what Rovers want to do this season and the way they've talked. Forget that it's all FC. You should be beating Mm. teams like that. You know, I know it's going to be tough. I don't think people are on about 30, 40 points out there, the neutrals. I think it's going to be close. But there's no doubt for me that if we want to be where we're at this season and we want to be chasing silverware like Willie spoke to Jenna and the whole live so many times about, then you've got to be picking these teams off. Because again, forget that it's Hull. Forget that it's the first game of the season. I think in the long run, Rovers are going to be streets ahead of this black and white side this season and I think we've got to start strong the season like we did last year against Wigan and yeah f- for me I know they've got a few injuries so have we but there's no reason why we shouldn't be putting them aside you know on my tip and I didn't buy about 20 and that is probably being arrogant and you never know it might come back to bite us but we're in a stage where probably there was a few years ago weren't they, when there was on top of us and you, that, you know, that we was using the excuse, well, you should be beating us anyhow. That's what they're doing now, aren't they? So it's a win-win for them either way because if we beat them, then they'll be going, well, you should have beat us. You're going to be the next big things. But then if they get to beat us, they'll be like, but hell, you were saying you was going to win everything before a ball was kicked. But yeah, I am a bit nervous, to be honest, just because I think everyone's tipping Rovers. And I just, obviously, first game back being a fan, I want to um, experience a victory. So I'm hoping that the gods align and we get over the, um, the two points. Yeah, Dan, I mean, pre-season seems to have been like forever, doesn't it? It's, it just seems to have gone on and gone on. And obviously, we're just a couple of days away now from the first game of the season. I think the players will be absolutely chomping at the bit to get out there. There seems to be real steeliness, determination about the squad. Um, and I think that's breeding it into the in, into the supporters as well, in, in terms of we're ready for the game, we're ready to take to the stage almost. And, and yeah, take, take out the fact it's a derby. You know, I think we're all ready for that first game of the season. And of course, it is the derby, which has a, a little bit more significance to it. But, you know, ultimately, it is two points at the end of the day. And, and the season's not determined by what happens on Thursday night. But it would be great to start the season with a victory. No, yeah, like, like you said, like Joe says, we need, we need to sort of take it, out, take it out of the equation that it's them. We need, we need the two points. If we're going to be 
up their top two, three side, we need to be beating the teams that are going to be near the bottom. And that that's what we need to be in for. Like you say, with the the attitude coming out of camp, you've got the likes of Minchella today, just listening to him on the in, the interviews, he just they just all seem to be on the same on the same page, the same goals, the same narrative, you know, Willie Peters and the whole KR way. Everybody seems to be on board with that. Which I think is absolutely brilliant and it's what we need, this bit of a togetherness. Not there's no one man that's going to define the season. Everybody's on the same page, same goals. Let's achieve it together. Yeah, Joe. I mean, if anyone has had the chance to listen to the to the pre press uh, pre match mm. press conference with um, Elliot Minchella, he's he's a very impressive individual. Joe, he, he seems to have took on that leadership mantle um, even greater than he already did as vice captain. Now he's he's, he's the captain, and he's had um, some great tutelage under Sean Kenny Dowell, and and um, he is still a young guy as well. He's, he's you know, he, he, he's but he's somebody who, who commands obviously the respect to the squad and, and the way he speaks. And, and for me, he he epitomizes that determination, that steeliness. Almost, he's got a bit of ice running through him. Um, he, he seems to set things in his stride. Obviously, you you've got a chance to, to speak to him previously, and and when when he was named captain, um, I don't think many people's eyebrows were raised at it. Just the way that he has conducted himself already. I think, like Dan mentioned there, the OKR way, I think it's about taking knocks and coming back into the foreign. And I think that's what he did, obviously. He played the first round last season. Didn't want up to standard. Willie Peters gave him quite a stern talking to. He goes away and spit his dummy out because we've seen if people do want to spit the dummy out and stuff, then they'll get released. If You know, get moved on. Whereas Elliot went, learnt from his mistakes and arguably was one of the best fair teams in the comp last year, along with John Asiata. But yeah, I think he, he was probably the born leader, wanted the born successor to Sean Kenny Dowell. I'm sure Skids had a word with Willie saying it's probably Minnie's time to shine. And yeah, a really good interview earlier. Obviously, he has captain the side before, unofficially, you know, if you want to call it that. Now he is the official captain of the Robins. And yeah, no greater game to lead in his first one than at their ground, obviously, against the Black and Whites. And I always say, for a kid from West Yorkshire, you won't get many more West Yorkshire lads who've bought into East Hull and moving over these side uh, neck of the woods and proper buying into what the Robins are about. And I think that's what Willie Peters wants. He wants that one club mantra and everyone's got to be singing from the same hymn sheet. And he certainly does that. And yeah, I think he'll go bigger and better this season. And there's not many middles, especially loose forward, who's got the ball handling skills of him, who can act like a prop forward and, you know, probably play a full game. Couldn't he'd run his blood to water every game if he could? But yeah, so I think big season for Mini as well. Yeah, just last one, Joe, before we talk about Super League in general in 2024. Mm -hmm. Is is Minchella an 80 minute player yet? I think he could be, but we saw it. I always go back to like when um, we had joined Tony Smith last year, didn't we? With um, like George King when he was the out and out best middle, and we kind of ran him to the ground, didn't we? So I don't think we need to. Obviously, we'll go on to speaking about what our squads will probably look like on Thursday, but you have got options now, aren't you? I know that them two are injured at the moment, but Sam Luckley and Matty Staunton should be back within a week or two. You've got Dean Adley who can play numerous roles. Then, you know, even Whitbread has had a stint at 13 in the NRL. So, you, you, he can move about and chop and change and I think that's the beauty of Rovers' this pack this season. Hopefully, get them two lads back fit and we don't we get through it unscathed on Thursday because every single player, barring a few, can play in the back row, loose forward and stuff. So, if he is flagging a bit, you've got the chance to bring him off and then little other leaders will step up but I'm sure he'll be leading from the sideline when he's off for his five minute stints what he normally does yeah definitely Dan um, so if you look at Super League as a whole in 2024 I mean we're talking about Hull has potentially been uh, a team that that will finish outside the playoffs do you think they're in a, a mini league almost with London Castleford and, and Hull in there or do you think they're a little bit higher than that it's difficult to say at the moment, isn't it? You, you won't know until probably about round five, six, where teams are going to be. I think you've got the bottom four, aren't you? London, Cass, Salford and Hull, for me, on paper. You say, ball haven't been kicked in anger yet. You, you can't really take the friendlies into account. But, yeah, I think I think there's sort of that bottom four and there's that push for the top six. Ideally, we don't want to be scraping it round for last few games of the season to try and squeeze in the six. We want to secure top four by then, really, don't we? For if, if we're going to build on last season, which should be the aim this season, shouldn't it, really? We shouldn't be thinking, right, we've finished finished fourth last season, right, we've got to make the playoffs this season. It should be, no, we need to, fourth or third is the target this season, isn't it? Yeah, and Joe, you could probably, 
Well, I say he probably could, but discount London. I mean, obviously we saw we saw what Lee did last season, but the circumstances around their promotion compared to London very very different. Lee almost rolled the dice early on in their championship campaign and started bringing players in. London with the uh, provisional IMG rating know that unless they, I mean, they probably have to win it, wouldn't they? Or at least get to the grand final to mm-hmm. to stand a chance of staying in Super League. I think they're still running with a few part-time players. And even now, when you look at them um, heading into their opening game of the season, they're already suffering uh, a bad injury record. It just doesn't look, doesn't look too clever for London this season. No, it doesn't. I mean, they, they had a skinny squad before, obviously, these injuries occurred. And it's big names, isn't it? It's the um, Leyland, Rock, who they had big names. Um, Promise for Lewis Beanek, who, of course, played for the Black and Whites as well. So, he's had Super League experience. They're just... You, you you feel sorry for them, don't they? Obviously, they're there on merit and they deserve to come up. But arguably, losing the likes of Corey Norman and that, they've probably got a weaker squad this season. And I saw the bookies were giving them six to one not to win a regular game, and it wouldn't surprise me. But obviously, there is a few poor teams this season, and I don't I don't think they'll go um, winless all season. They might win one or two, but yeah, it's they're there kind of just to make up the numbers, aren't they? And I know they won't say that, and I know the fans obviously they've got a, a small but passionate fan base, and the players will prepare every week and do the media duties but they're just going into it go and have a bit of a laugh go have an experience at first team at first um, division level and no, they've got nothing to lose have they everyone's expecting them to get pumped every single week they get, get a, a tough start from against St Ellen's away and yeah I think from a bit of a selfish point of view as well obviously we've got we want to be in the playoffs this season and we want to be in that top two, three, four, whatever we play London three times this season we play Hull three times Casp teams like that then you know you should be winning them three times because you do that that's already 18 points I know that's looking ahead and obviously with the ball haven't been kicked yet, but when you break it down with these loop fixtures, we have got some decent ones this season, especially London, I think, at home twice. Yeah, tempting yeah. fate there though, aren't you, Joe? <laughs> I, well, you, you know for a fact the first victory is going to happen at Plough Lane against the Robins, aren't they? I think it's a week before the Challenge Cup final, so hopefully that's two trips to London in seven days. <laughs> yeah, back end amazing, isn't it, uh, when we take yeah. on London? Yeah. Um, <laughs> For me, Joe, it's the teams who then fall in maybe the, the next couple of places, which is the interesting one. I mean, Castleford, mm. we saw former Hull Kingston Rovers, assistant coach Dan Maguire joined them as assistant. Um, big 10 over a players there, Rowan Milnes, Sam Wood heading over to Castleford. Um, but when I have a look at that squad, and you still see the likes of McShane, Westerman, Watts, um, you know... Although there's been a, a, a change over of players, a new head coach, new assistant, the squad still doesn't seem to be uh, well good enough to challenge for a top six place, and let alone um, anything more than that. I've, I think they'll finish 10th, mate. I think Salford will finish 11th. Um, that's what I've tipped to many. I just think Salford have got a better team, a better 17, but they just haven't got the players, have they? And if injuries creep in, I think they're down to 23 already. Obviously, Vunny R was got a ban. Ethan Ryan's out till May, I believe. So, you've and you've already got a skinny squad and, you know, you've seen what that St. Ellen's did to them um, in that friendly. I know you can't read much into it, but I just think if they pick up a few knocks, you know, there was talk of Chris Atkin training on the wing, won't they, in pre-season? So, that's not good. Whereas Cass... Yeah, I don't think they're going to be great, but they've got a new owner again for the millionth time in a season. The stadium plans are getting done up again. They've brought some youth in, so I think they'll have more energy. I think they're trying to build out that they'd be delusional so not to, you know, to think they're going to be anywhere near the top six. But I do think they'll be better this year, and I think they're trying to clear the dead wood out. Obviously, you've mentioned some names there. They've still got the likes of Albert Vette and that was, you know, stealing a wage last season. Let's not put it lightly. He went to Donny in League One and there's been a lot of pre-season chatter about him. So, yeah, they've, they've obviously changed the quarter um, quota recruitment differently now they're getting people over from the NRL whereas before it was just people getting released from Super League clubs, which I could never get my head around. But, yeah, I think Cass, Salford, London and Hull FC, I think, will be the bottom four. Um, I think FC 9th, Cast 10th, Salford 11th, London 12th for me. Yeah, Dan, Salford haven't had a great pre-season. They lost, of course, Sandy Ackers, Brody Croft. Um, they lost Ken Seo, Joe Burgess, acrimonious fallout. We still don't quite know the details of that, although Joe Burgess has spoke quite publicly about how, how shit it was. Um, but their loss is our gain. Um, Salford, that... They're flat to deceive sometimes, don't they, in terms of um, the squad, the players that they have. They seem to have been able to get more out of them than 
than maybe they should have done over the last couple of years. But surely, when you look at the squad this season, Salford are, are going to be a, a side that struggles. Yeah, I, I agree with Joe. I think they'll be right right near the bottom of Salford. They had a bit of good news today, don't they? they as the council bought the stadium, mm. they've taken over the stadium, which is good news for them. So they've got a permanent home there, which is good. good for the game in general in Manchester, isn't it? Um, but like you said, they just seem to be able to load the players over. Like they've had Jackson Hastings in recent years, haven't they? They've got Brody Cross and, and, and whatnot. But I think that they're the big loss, aren't they? Brody Croft and Andy Ackers for Leeds are just a massive loss. I just can't see where they go from here, really. Uh, I think similar to Cass, aren't they? They're a club that has that aren't really blessed with wealth at the minute. But uh, 23 players for a squad isn't, isn't anywhere near enough, is it? You see last season, the, the way the game was going, how fast-paced it is, you're decimated by injuries, aren't you? Because it is, that's the nature of the game, isn't it? That's the way it's going. And I, yeah, I, see, I can't see anything other than them down at the bottom of London, really. Yeah, Joe, let's talk about them top six spots. Um, Wigan, Saints, um, Warrington, Rovers, Catalan. You know, there's... When you start filling them slots up, you know, like I said, fingers crossed that I don't think some rovers are part of that because if they're not yeah. part of that, you know, it's something must have gone wrong along the way. But it is going to be hugely competitive. Uh, Huddersfield, do you think they've they've got a, an outside chance, or, or do you think it's uh, another season out of the playoffs for them? I think if it is, I think if it's the latter, he'll be the first coach to go. Uh, but you look, I think their first three games are Lee. St. Ellen's and Wigan um, and obviously they're missing Luke Yates now I think he's got a big ban and he misses them three games he's he's probably their best player for me in the pack I think he's brilliant at loose forward um, yeah I don't know because they've signed some good players haven't they obviously you've got a bit of unknown quantities in Clune and Merch who have come over from the NRL and you can't really say what they're going to do um, they've lost some big names obviously McGilvery has gone but they've replaced him with Adam Swift um, who was a very good player in a bang average mm-hmm. FC side last season and then they've still got the likes of Chris Hill going strong at 42 whatever he is so it's a, they're a real <laughs> weird team I, I always feel for Ken Day because he's pumped so much money in and then when you go there it's like a you know a graveyard isn't it sometimes especially if it's two poorly supported teams um, yeah I I think Huddersfield will either be top four or probably eighth. But you never know what you're going to get with them. But then you could say the same about Warrington with Sam Bear. Just obviously Sky and everyone's bigging it up. But I don't know if he's he ready to be an head coach yet. He doesn't seem like he's the type of bloke who was ever going to be an head coach, does he? But he might wear wonders. And yeah, it's going to be interesting. And then you've got Leeds, who I don't think will be as good as everybody thinks. I think Lee will be good again, but many people don't. But I think Lee will be right up there. And then you've got your obvious, your Wiggins, Catalans, Saints. And then hopefully he'll okay, fit into that bracket as well. But yeah, um, seven or eight don't fit into six, did he? So we've got to be right on the ball. And I think you look at our opening two months, you've got to be picking up, I won't say maximum points because you'd be in dreamland then, wouldn't you? But you've got to be there or thereabouts because you don't want to get dragged into a end of season race for that top six, especially if you're going deep in the cup as well. But yeah, so excited. It's going to be a great competition. And again, from one to seven, eight, can't call it, can you? Yeah, and Dan, I suppose Warrington are the ones that have got the big um, eyes on them, aren't they, in terms of Sam Burgess? I mean, it doesn't matter who they seem to have as head coach or which players they have, they seem to come up with the same outcome. Um, obviously, they've rolled the dice with Burgess. It's his first head coach role. Um, so you do wonder whether they're actually going to finally crack it. Um Daryl Powell wasn't able to get a tune out with that side and obviously there's been a bit of a turnover in, in the playing roster but you know no doubt Sam Burgess will be the darling of the TV cameras it's just whether he's able to get him off to a good start because you know that if things start going wrong early on it can become a bit of a, a sore destroying place to Halliwell Jones Yeah I, I just can't see him as a logical appointment for him you, you think if they're they're trying to push themselves, Warrington. They have he's got a bit of money, hasn't he? Is it um, Sam and what's he called? Yeah, they, their chairman. He's got a bit of money. I just don't see it as a logical appointment. You think they've chopped around in Australia, similar to what we did with Willie Peters and got the right man. Um, it could go one or two ways. It could work for him, but he's what he needs to do is sort the culture out there because I think that's been the big thing. I think Powell soon realised that the culture there was just rotten on it to the core and just players there just just there for a payday. Not really bothered about the rugby, but he's got some good players. Like he's, got, he's obviously got George Williams there. He's got a few others, and 
if he can get a tune out of them, there's no reason why they can't make the top six, is there? I've got them just on my on my twelve. I've got them just outside. Them all leave for six for me. <clears throat> They're a poison yeah. chalice, though, aren't they? Though Warrington, did you watch the highlights against Lee? You know they're, they're going down twelve nil, and the fans are booing like it's a league game. There's so much pressure, isn't there, at that club? And I, I, you look at the side. I think they're a team of individuals for me. I don't think they're ever been a team, and I think they might get off to a good start, but they just peter out constantly, don't they? I just think there's too much pressure on. You know, probably Burgess and stuff, and I just can't see them making it. But you never know, dear. But yeah, it's um, they're a funny old club. <laughs> Yeah, so Joe, if we look right at the very top end then, so we look at mm. League Leaders Shield, and we look at potential grand finalists. I mean, Wigan, <laughs> you know, you can't look beyond them, but St. Helens will be smarting from not being able to, to lift the trophy last time out. Catalan Dragons, all the noise coming out of there is, is really positive about how they've not had to rebuild the team. Actually, they've just um, added to it. John and Abdul, mm. of course, over there on the season on loan deal. Um, so it is going to be interesting to see who finishes with that league leader's shield and then who makes um, Old Trafford. The team who I've got a few question marks of is probably Saints. The, you know, I, I just think they've got some brilliant young kids and up and coming, you know, they're, they're always, they're a production line, aren't they? And they've still got some amazing players in Wellsby and the likes of that. But I just think, is it going to be a transition period after losing your James Roby and McCarthy Scarsbrook? I'm not convinced about T. Rickson and Conrad Aral as two quarter players. Again, they'll bed through you for the, and the next Jack Wellsby will step up soon. And I think they'll be in the top half. Of course, I don't, I'm not saying they're going to be at the bottom four, but I just think, is it, I think they might just have another season where not going through the motions but having another transition you know looking at the end of people's contracts moving on getting the youth product up I think we're going to there aren't they they're the ones who everyone's I think the, the one to far on some out there to win everything and uh, of course they've got a brilliant team but until they get back on the grass you never know do you Obviously, the looks good against all, but it's a friendly and you can't read too much into it. Catalan always have that Perpignan spark where it's always tough to go over there, has been since they came to Super League. And then you, you're looking that and then you're thinking, is it going to be a Rovers or Lee in the top four again or what's it going to be? But I don't think there's nothing to fear. I think it's a very competitive division. But when you look, you, we always in that mentality, if, you're, if it's your own club and again, going away from the arrogant side of it, you always look at other teams, don't you, and big them up and go, oh, what a team they've got. But you only have to look on Twitter and everywhere else and I know some rugby league fans opinions are don't really matter but people are talking about Rovers now and it's nice to be in that bracket and you know it's time to walk the walk a bit and there's no reason why we can't be in the upper echelons again No but Dan Joe's right isn't he you know it, it's time to walk the walk kind of thing you know we, we've got to be beating St Helens Wigan Catalan more so when we play at their place as well um, and I think there's a few hoodoos we need to sort of get off our back here to and I think that is what propels us into that top three bracket. Can, can you see them breaking into there, uh, Dan, next season? Um, do you know what you say, top three bracket? Joe's mentioned that he's got some question marks about Leeds. For me, Catalan, I, I don't think they'll be top two side this year. I think they might be, you know, fourth, fifth, maybe sixth. I think that... I don't know. I just, I just there's something about them. I just can't see, can't see it this season. I, I think the recruitment they've signed some older players, and I don't, I don't necessarily think that's going to help them, especially with the heat out there. It's their away form, though, isn't it? If they can crack that, they, like you say, going to Perpignan's horrible. It's yeah. Well, like you say, with Hildes and that, I've been to Perpignan like ten times. I've seen them win one. So <laughs> maybe I shouldn't go this year. Yeah. yeah, it's not a happy hunting ground. Joe, let's go right back to the MKM Stadium on Thursday night then. Squad news announced earlier today. Um, Rovers missing Matty Stoughton and Sam Luckley. We'll look at the whole FC squad news. They're missing Brad Fash, Carlos Tovavi, Liam Tindall. They include six of their new signings. Um, I think all of Rovers' new signings are in the squad, aren't they, for, for the game on Thursday? Um Joe Burgess, he was one who I thought might have missed out, but he's, he's made the 21-man squad. If you look at your 18, Joe, who, who misses out from the 21? Um, I think Louis Gorman misses out for me. Um, 
personally, I probably have different opinions than there was when I put my team out earlier. I don't think you play Corey all just because of why you've got to go big on the bench. For me, I think your team, your starting team pretty much picks itself. Um, and then on the bench, I'd go big. I'd, I'd have Matt Parcell on the bench with um, George King, Jesse Sue, and then have uh, Yusuf Ardin or Leo Tennyson, me. I understand why people want Corey all there as backup because there's question marks over Tanganoa, but I think Kalepi will play. And obviously, if Dean Adley starts at prop, text the brunt of SASA and Pele for the first 20 minutes or so. And then when they go off knackered, bring on your Jesse Sue's, your Matt Parcells and George Kings of the world and you can run riot. I watched the full game against Wigan, the FC game and don't get me wrong, Pele and SASA did well for the first 15 minutes and um, they threw a lot at Wigan, they just couldn't create anything. That's what they're going to do, aren't they? The first 15 minutes, the old fans will be bouncing. Pele might smash somebody and they might make a half break. You've just got to compose. You've just got to chill out and, you know, take whatever they're going to throw at you in the first 15 minutes. And then when that intensity drops down, like in a derby, like it always does, then it's when your Mikeys and your Mays and your Jerseys can take note because they'll tire. They've got a big pack and they've been, everyone's been raving about this big pack, haven't they? That it's going to be the saving grace. So have we. We've got a big pack, you know, really impressed with. Whitbread at Leeds I thought he was really good I think George King hasn't maybe had the best pre-season by all accounts but we know what he can do on the pitch Um and then you, you've got your Dean Adleys and that of the world who will wear courses. And for me, I, that, that's what that's how I'd go. I think you just take what they're going to give you the first 10, 15 minutes. It might not be perfect, might be gritty, but then if you can get their, their bench on, which I think looks very, very weak compared to ours, that's when you can start turning the screw. Yeah, you're right. They've got a number of youngsters who are making up their 21-man squad. Um, you do wonder if, if Tony Smith wants to get into a middles battle and he's going to try and beat us up down the middle because if you look at their... Um, their backs, you know, there's, there's not much creativity there, is there? You know, they've obviously got Brown who's come in, uh, New Zealand International. I think Joe Kate has been lining up at Hooker as well. So yeah. something a different for them. But you start looking at, at across the board and, and there isn't much creativity there in terms of players who, who've got pace and speed um, who, can, who can do something off the cuff. They just don't seem to have that. So you do think it's going to become a bit of an arm wrestle in the middle. It's whether... Their forwards can, can can keep up that intensity, and, and and you almost want them to try and do these big hits and, and and the showman stuff. So it looks great to the crowd, but in reality, it doesn't mean anything, does it? No, I'm, I mean, again, I, I always think you can't go off friendlies and I don't want to sound like a broken record there, but I've seen all against Doncaster and I've seen him against um, Wigan. Obviously, they beat Donny by 20 in the end and then got thumped by Wigan. But what, what just it looks like for me is they'll give it to New Brown. He'll pass out the bat to Jack Walker. Jack will try and go side to side, try and look for a gap. There's not much there and then they'll try some off the cuff. You've just got to get at him in defence. Stop New Brown because he looks an Andy player. But again, a bit like Clifford last season, didn't really have much support around him. He made a few half breaks against Wigan, looked around and there was nobody there to be seen. And yeah, like you said, mate, they're going to have the moments. There's going to be them, you know, ass twitching moments in the North Stand, didn't they, when they make an half break or they put a big tackle on. But overall, I think the bigger picture is Rovers have got a better side and they've got to go there arrogant and go, no, it doesn't matter that it's your turf. We're going to come and bully you. And yeah, you can have your props for your first 10, 15 minutes and then we'll, you know, we'll see after that if they can carry on and that's where I think the battle will be won. Out there, outside backs. Obviously, I think Lewis Martin will play on the wing, and it's going to be interesting to see who he plays against. Will it be Nala Valds or will it be Joe Burgess? Obviously, McIntosh will be on their right, opposite Ryan, all on the left. But yeah, I just think overall we, we've got to take them to the cleaners here because yeah, it's round one. It's not going to be the best game probably skill wise, but you, you look at the twenty ones, the seventeens, and you know we should be getting the two points there. Yeah, Dan, does Joe Bear just score 18 or I would like to see Evolds and his pace because we saw, didn't we, in that 14-0 uh, victory that, you know, you get some speed, speedsters on there and you get some uh, open play and, and you can take full advantage. Of course, that was a different side, different, you know, different season. But I do feel like this is a game where some of the speedsters could really take advantage of, of broken play, you know, and I think Evolds could be the one who gets the nod, especially when you consider Bear just missed what a month of preseason. Um, yeah. didn't feature in the in the preseason friendlies. But who knows? That that's the beauty of the derby, isn't it? There's always a bit of a curveball, a little bit something different that we might not have expected. Yeah, I, I can see Bear just maybe having a couple of runouts for maybe Feverston on Joel Reg before we get him in the squad. But uh, yeah, I've, I've gone uh, Evolds on the wing. I think he's he's been playing the friendlies and he's uh, he's well the 
been so friendly they played in the Leeds game. But I, yeah, I've I've not got Burgess on in my eight team. I've I've gone on probably similar to everybody else with the, the main squad. But I've started Hadley at prop with Sue and King on the bench as the props on the bench and maybe keep maybe have Tennyson on the bench. But he looked quite handy <clears throat> pre season. Um yeah, going going back to like looking at their like comparing the squads, they, they haven't got a recognised app. But that new Brown is a, is an hooker by trade, isn't they? And you look at their even like you know, you're gonna, you're gonna have Hall and Gildar lining up against I don't know Ma- Macintosh and Cameron Scott, aren't you? And then e- even inside them, you've got that uh, Ockenbo watching them for Canterbury could not tackle somebody, didn't it? Could he? he wasn't, wasn't bothered. I, I just I think that's the way to beat them. You know, you're gonna you're gonna struggle against Pe- Pele and SAS. That's their game, and it like you said, big lads. I think the way to beat them is out the back. You're gonna have so much joy out there. You saw that at the, the Derby and you know it's different players, but in the Derby and Good Friday last year when we put Falk on them, we were just passing out to the left, weren't we? And just walking through them. And I think that, that could be a similar story with this. Yeah, Joe, I mean, one thing Willie Peters has said is um, on what he's he's got a bit of a track record for us. He does like to reward players. Now obviously um Corey Hall, he's, he's been featuring in a new position. He's trying to add a bit of versatility to his game. And the fact he's featured so heavily, um, does it point to the fact that actually he's going to be rewarded with a first-team jersey? Um, I think Willie Peters during the week also, it was interesting what he said about Tennyson, saying actually how he performs better than he trains. Um, mm. And then the change his training schedule or he increases intensity. But if he feels that he's a... He's a, a player who performs when he's put out on the pitch. Then you could argue it. The derby on Thursday night is the perfect opportunity for him to get some game time, and and I suppose it's a, a good opportunity, isn't it, for for these players to who have performed well in friendlies or or done well in pre-season training that there is a there's a light at the end of the tunnel and, and there is a reward because obviously that brings other players along with them as well to say you know look this is your reward if you if you do what we ask you to do. Yeah, of course. And I think if, you know, it's either on the bench, Corey Hall, Yusuf Hardin, or Leo Tennyson's probably going to play, aren't they? So if you'd have gone back a few months when the derby was named, you wouldn't have put any of them on your bench. But obviously, people change and there's a few injuries. But yeah, they can stake a claim. Again, it'll all come down to tactics. It as well of how he wants to line up and I know Corey's had a really good pre-season I, th- I think in the two games for me I think he did struggle I know Willie kind of pointed him out didn't he in the Leeds game and he sees different things to us but I thought especially the tries I think at least two or three of them he was he was at fault at for me um, but again it's the bigger picture isn't it? it's not just them but in them key moments is he ready to fit in the back row against the Sauer and Ockenboer on opening night in front of 20,000 people probably not but can you maybe put him on the bench maybe it offers a utility option it, but we'll see. But I think what will be interesting is the new rules as well. Um, I think Rovers have done really well, haven't they, with the play of the balls? I, I remember minimal offences yeah. in both the Chef and the Leeds game, whereas Hull on the other hand have struggled a few times, um, especially the big props. When there was tired, the likes of Ashworth and that conceded a few penalties against Hull and obviously they're going to be clamping that down um, this season. So I think if Rovers can adhere to the new rules and kind of take the game to them, have a bit of that wind-up marching about them, Hull have got the tendency to, you know, be a bit sloppy and discipline-wise. I know Tony highlighted it in the victory over Bradford, the victory over Donny in the defeat to Wigan. He kept speaking about discipline. If you can get the likes of Mikey and Jez and Matt Parcell running around the likes of Ashworth and that, then you should be winning penalties for days there. So it's all these little tactics where I think Rovers, you know, can come up up the upper hand there. But yeah, for for me, I'd like to see Arden or Tennyson in that fourth spot. Yeah, for me, Joe, I think the speed around the rook is what what wins it for Rovers, and I think their ability to to offload and and you know the fact that Jez Litton is is been given that that starting role. Are we expecting to be given that starting role? Yeah. Willie Peters already mentioned that he's he, he wants him to be first choice, but I mean when you look at who his replacement is, Matt Parcell, uh, it, it's um, you know an envious position to be in for. Footballs, isn't it? So I reckon speed. That is why I wonder if you might just give the nod to Corey Hall in terms of his his, his speed and his ability. But like you said, he was short in defence in, in in the preseason friendlies, and there's no doubt you can get away with it in preseason friendlies when the results don't matter. When you're playing the first game of the season in front of twenty odd thousand people at, at, uh, in a whole derby, and the world's watching you, you know it's a different different yeah. place. But then again. 
if you're not put into these positions, how does a coach know you're going to react? So it is going to be really, really interesting to see how they line up. One thing that intrigues me, Joe, is around the uh, the flexibility of the players within a game. So we're getting the leads friendly. We saw Iku move to centre. We saw Gildak um, change position as well. We saw Tom Opacic go out onto the wing. Do you think that's a feature or do you think that was just purely for pre-season and, and needs must at the time? Yeah, I hope so. I wouldn't like to see everything chopping and changing when you're at home to St. Helens after 20 minutes. I'd like to have seen Nickel got a bit more time at fullback in the Leeds game. Obviously, I know he was trying different things out, but then that's why I always thought should have played a little bit of a stronger squad against Sheffield because then you could have done 20 minutes, 30 minutes there. Again, we're not the coach, so we don't know. And I know Willie's not that massively keen on friendlies, but for me, they're there for a reason and you've got to run them out and the players are pay, um, paid to play, aren't they? But yeah, for me, I think if he's earmarking Hicker as a fullback and yeah, about can move there but then you'd have to move Gilda or Opacek on the wing and Iku into the centre and for me that just wouldn't work so I hope it was just because it was a friendly and he wanted to try some different combinations out but I think come game day come Super League you've got to have your, your square pegs in square holes haven't you? <laughs> yeah and Dan what do you make of Willie Peters comments that Taro May uh, sorry Taro May's comments that he's, he's in the side to basically feed Mikey Lewis and, and, and Tyrone Mays, the, the, the organiser, the, the guy who's orchestrating the team around the pitch, and Mikey Lewis is the one who's, who's sort of playing off the cuff, giving that freedom, that, that free role that he seems to, to enjoy. Yeah, I th well, I think that's a good thing. It can only be a good thing, isn't it? Because you look at last season when we had, uh, before Schneider come over, we had Milnes and Lewis. I think Lewis was having to do everything, wasn't he? And I think mm. it stifled him a bit. He, he couldn't play his own game. He play, his game is isn't the directing the troops around the pitch, is it? It's it's the off the cuff little half back, isn't he? He's not the not the not the big general. Like when I went to the grand final, obviously with Santero and May by them, so watching him, you just watch what he does. He doesn't he, he sort of not don't go unnoticed, but he sits sits at the back and directs the troops. It all it all went through him. But there wasn't it wasn't much flash stuff it but you you watch what he actually does and it's the little kicks through the he knows where who's where his runners are, he knows where to pass the ball. And I think that can only it can only benefit the likes of Mikey Lewis. It just gives him that bit more freedom to play, it takes the pressure off him. Because he is he, 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 he does, we sometimes forget that he's only what 21, 22 year old. Just takes the pressure off him in that respect. He lets him have his little have his freedom to play his game. Yeah, Joe Taron May, he's the one player that I'm really looking forward to seeing. I think he's 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 got a really sort of I don't not a funny playing style, but the way he sort of roams around the pitch and he's he's always trying to offload, he's looking for the pass, he's always he seems to be someone who's just always trying to see what's on him and, and, and what's on offer. And, and obviously his role is to provide a platform for, for Mikey Lewis to be able to come up with those moments of magic. That said, Taron May is equally capable of doing producing his own moments of magic, isn't he? And especially with his assists. Well, that's the thing. I think it was 22, won it last season mm. in the regular season. So he's not he's not coming over and just directing the troops as well, is he? Do you know what I mean? He, he can score a try. I really like his short kicking game. You know, people have, when Abdul left, obviously everyone was going, Rovers haven't got a kicking game anymore. For me, Mike, his high kicks are getting better and better every game. Um, and he'll have worked on that a lot in the off-season. And for me, I think I thought Tyro May, along with the likes of Harry Smith and that, have got one of the best short kicking games um, in the Super League. And I think Bachelor and Tanga Noah will really benefit from that. Because if you look at Catalan last season, on the fifth, Tyro May always likes to dink it into that little area where the back rowers are. So, you know, if they're always worth a punt, probably on Scarbet beforehand, if they're both playing. But yeah, for me, I think if May and Mikey can click, people talk about contrasting styles and all that. They'd worked on it in the off season. If them two can work together, and you can have Hiku fully fit out the back in the span, and then Matt Parcel and Jez at nine and Mini at thirteen, you know that that's some span in it, and everything around around that will come together because of them five or six players there. Um, and yeah, really looking forward to seeing what he can do. I think he's he's hungry and he, he I liked his interview with Dave Craven at the mirror where he said, I'm not, you know, I've played the victim for a few years now and I've been you know, I've been a bad boy and I know what I've done and I'm mature now and I've looking forward to coming to Rovers and the fact that he didn't realise how good some of the Rovers players would be in the setup and that, comparing it to Penrith. I know sometimes words can be only you know, words are there for a reason and the play up to the media. I've dealt with it for two years, but I think he means what he says and he's come over not for a pay. They obviously will be on big books and that. 
but I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing what he can do. And now that he's playing in front of a crowd at Craven Park every single week, it'll be interesting to see if he can fully buy in. Because if he does, then I think we've got an absolute brilliant span that we can work with this year. Yeah, and it's that span you've just mentioned there, Joe, that makes me believe that Rovers are going to be good for at least 20 points in front of all on Feds. And I, I just think we're going to absolutely blow them away. I'm, I'm, I, you know what? It's a weird feeling because I'm supremely confident for the first time in going into a derby. <laughs> Normally I'm full of angst and anxiety and, and worry and, and all, everything that goes with it. But for, for once, it might be a derby that I might actually enjoy. That said, they'll probably go get dicked and go get beat and then I'll have to go back to work and I'll yeah. split off and get the, uh, the piss suck out of me for being too confident. But that is the beauty of sport, isn't it? And if and if we didn't have that, you know, the, there would be no point in sport. There would be no point because everyone's got a chance. I just don't think they've got a good enough chance on Thursday, Dan. No, I... I've gone a bit closer and I've gone eight points. I, I do think it'll be a bit closer. I think the weather will play parks. It's meant to tip it down, isn't it? The forecast mm. to tip it down. So I, don't, I think that might stifle a bit of, you know, exciting play. But yeah, I think we've got too much room. I think, like you said, like we said earlier, the bench is the big thing for me. Their bench is quite, quite soft in it. And I think, like Joe said, weather the storm, they're going to throw everything at us. They're going to try and put some big hits in, but that's where the gaps are going to be. When they're more bothered about smashing Mikey Lewis, he, he's just got to take it, not get wound up, and they're there where, they're where the gaps are going to appear. When they're flying out the line trying to hit us, then big lads Pele trying to prove a point how good he is. I can smash, smash the little lads. Well, that's when we'll find the gaps. Yeah, 100%. Huge thanks, guys, for joining us on the Robin Pod. Uh, if you're travelling to the game on Thursday, make sure you're loud and proud. I think there are, what, 3,500 Rovers fans. I'm sure there'll be plenty more who have got in and got tickets. So if you are there, make yourself your presence known and make sure you back the boys. It's going to be an interesting game as the Hutters, Hull, Kicks and Rovers go in search of the first two points of the 2024 Super League campaign. For now, though, live, love, laugh and be happy. Oh! <laughs>